Good evening, everyone. Welcome to part two of the Frederick News Post Education Forum. I first wanted to thank uh, Lance Ruggi for his interesting presentation on current trends in education. Uh, it was nice to have it interactive, and I appreciate all of you who turned out and voted with your clickers. Uh, that was fun, and hopefully it gave the board members, educational candidates here, some things to think about. So, now, the Board of Education is a nonpartisan election, as you all know, and when I read that, I'm reminded of a state senator I knew when I was a young reporter covering the General Assembly in Annapolis. His name was Howard Dennis. He was a Republican, a moderate Republican who represented mostly a Democratic district. And one of his famous quotes, he was always good for a quote, was, there is no Democratic or Republican way to collect the garbage, it just has to get done. That's slightly different than education. Education is a little more uh, complicated, but I do think uh, education is one of those things where people can come together uh, and form a lot of agreement and do some good. Education is one of the most important functions of local government. It is only through high quality, energetic, and engaging education that we can raise our children to be successful people and fully engaged citizens in the American experiment in self-government. Here are our four candidates for the Board of Education. Seated to your left to right, first is Michael G. Bunitsky, second is Ken Kerr, third is Cindy Rose, and fourth is Joy Schaefer. Thank you all for coming tonight, both audience members and candidates. Let's take a moment to go over the rules for tonight's forum. First, keep your eyes on the lights in the front. Uh, you'll see them uh, there. We only have, actually we have yellow, red, and green. The yellow will go off when you have 15 seconds remaining in your answer period. Red means you need to wrap it up. Uh, finish your thought by all means when you see the red, but remember that we will not let you ramble on too long. News Post editorial page editor, our new editorial page editor, Robert Snyder, is our timekeeper tonight. Thank you, Rob. And we'll begin with a two-minute opening statement from each of you proceeding in alphabetical order. That will be the first part. The second part will be a round where we ask each of you a unique question. You'll have 90 seconds to answer, but each of the four of you will get 30-second response after that 90-second answer. Part uh, in round two, we'll ask four or five general questions that all of you will be able to answer with one-minute replies. And finally, in round three, which will just be like round one, we'll go to asking each of you a neat question, and the other three will have 30 seconds to respond. And then finally, at the end, we'll end with one-minute statements, concluding statements from each of you. There we are. Okay. Everybody ready? We're going to begin with round one. These are unique questions for the four candidates. We'll start first round with Mike Bonitsky. Question one. Frederick County Public Schools has a new salary scale for teachers, which will require sustained funding over several years. Excuse me? Oh, sorry, I forgot the opening statements. Pardon me. So, we're starting with opening statements, two minutes apiece, and we will start with Mike Bonitsky. Two minutes. Rob's time. Okay, um, is this, can you hear? Yay. Closer the better on the microphone. Uh, welcome. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, uh, the News Post, for hosting us. Um, this race is an, an important race. It's one of our uh, most important races. It represents the challenge we face uh, in our community to determine how we invest in our education. Each of you is going to have to determine uh, uh, what your goals are and uh, which of us best represents your goals. There are some distinct differences in philosophy of education between the candidates here this evening. Uh, there's a wide variety of lifetime experiences that comes with that. Uh, we have, uh, sh these experiences have shaped our views, they've shaped our philosophy, and we hope we can represent something that will touch you this evening. Um, I've been a teacher for 40 years and an administrator for 20 plus of that 40 years. I've lived in Frederick County since 1980. I uh, started my teaching in PG County in 1975. Uh, I moved to Frederick in 1980 when Paul Straup and Carl Manweiler hired me to teach at TJ. I taught there at TJ High School until 1995 and became the curriculum specialist for secondary social studies, Carl's old job. In that capacity, I, I've dealt with assessments. I've dealt with assessments going back 
to the 1980s when A Nation at Risk was written and we started the assessment process all the way up through the mess of No Child Left Behind and NISPAP in between. Um, I've worked with uh, hundreds of teachers. I've worked with thousands of students. Um, I've conducted multiple uh, teacher uh, student leadership activities, Model UN, Civics and Law Academy, uh, the mock trial. I retired in February of this year. I believe I have a wide variety of experience. I hope that tonight uh, you'll see that um, uh, some of the experiences I have will strike a chord with you and that you'll vote for me in November. Good evening, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Frederick News Post, for organizing and the FCC for hosting. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to interview for this job, because essentially that's what we're doing here today. In the next 90 minutes, the four of us will try and convince you that we are the best people to oversee our public schools. It's over half a billion dollar budget, 66 schools, 40,000 students, 4,000 employees. It's a big job. So let me start by telling you about my qualifications. I don't come from an overly educated family. My grandfather was a high school custodian. My father didn't finish high school before he headed out to, to World War II. But uh, I had to overcome my own learning disabilities in the form of dyslexia. I was not a strong reader. I was probably what you would call a late intellectual bloomer. Uh, but I finished here at FC, FCC. I went on to Hood and uh, got a bachelor's degree, then I got a master's degree in professional writing from Towson University, and I have a doctorate in higher education from Morgan State University. I was an elementary school in the 19, elementary school teacher in the 1980s before I entered a career in the computer field. Uh, after my master's degree, I became a college professor, and I've been here at Frederick Community College since 1999. Uh, during that time, I've held a lot of professional leadership positions, including past president of the Developmental Education Association of Maryland, the Mid-Atlantic College Reading Association, other association leadership positions, and currently the vice chair of the Maryland Higher Education Commission Faculty Advisory Council. And in that capacity, I've, I've had the opportunity to go to Annapolis to work with regular, uh, regulatory review, and I was even able to get a law changed this year regarding uh, college general education mathematics. I hope to be able to convince you tonight that my background experience are what is needed on the Board of Education. Thank you, Ken Kerr. Now we go to Cindy Rose. I'd also like to thank the Frederick News Post and FCC for putting this event together. And most of all, I want to thank the community for coming out and showing their support for public education. The status quo has run the same failed, run on the same failed rhetoric, reduced class sizes, retained teacher quality, increased wages, it all sounds great. How many decades have we been doing that now? And what has changed? Well, for starters, we no longer control what our children are learning in the classroom. Common Core and the Next Generation Science Standards are created and overseen by people who don't live in our neighborhoods. Strip away the propaganda and you'll find few people who want to keep the Common Core in the park assessments. 22 people refused the assessments the year before last. Over 200 refused them last year. Something's wrong in education. The status quo has allowed the gutting and devolution of public education. Teaching is quickly losing its professional status. If the Elementary and Secondary Education Act has its way, classroom teachers will only need to attend a six-month teaching academy. Why? Because lessons in the future will come preloaded in a Chromebook and s or scripted in a packet. It's already happening, and it's called blended learning. Is this the future we want for public education? While the status quo has been in charge, beloved and respected and remarkable teachers like Matthew Johnston are forced to resign for telling the truth about labeling our children as failures. They have spent decades convincing the public teachers are leaving because they feel disrespected by us and are undercompensated. I spent the summer talking with those teachers. They do feel disrespected, but it's by the administrators and the reformers, not the voters of Frederick County. They feel disrespected because they were left behind in a world of corporate reformers. They want their classrooms back, they want to teach, and I want to help them. Thank you, Cindy. Now for Joy Schaefer. Um, 
Good evening. Thank you all, first of all, for taking time out of your schedules to come out uh, and hear us. And I appreciated you also, uh, Frederick Lee's Post, for hosting and for having such a, um, a very interesting speaker kick off our, our forum. Um, I'm Joy Schaefer. I currently am a member of the Board of Education. I was elected in 2012. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about why I'm seeking re-election in a minute, but just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm married with three children. We, leave, we moved here to Frederick um, uh, when, uh, about 15 years ago. I have three boys, all students in uh, FCPS, the public school system. Uh, they're in sixth grade, tenth grade, and twelfth grade. Um, and I came to uh, public service and to the board um, in, in a way a lot of us start out in the school system as parents, which is a, as a parent volunteer. I volunteered at my local schools, uh, at PTAs, and um, grew to uh, volunteer on a system-wide level at PTA Council. Um, at PTA Council, I was the chair for family involvement, which is a true uh, interest and goal of mine to make sure that families are welcomed and that feel that their schools are second homes for them, uh, that students feel at just at home at school as they do at home. Um, and I got on the board because I wanted to make sure that our board members had, uh, we had a board that had members that had every student's interest in mind, all students, all teachers, all faculty and staff, and our entire community because we do operate within Frederick County. Um, and uh, I do believe that education is key to our growth and our health as a community. Um, I'm running for re-election because I learned a lot in my four years as a board member. I thought I knew a lot about how the board worked because I dealt a lot with the board and advocated before the board as a PTA member. Um, but it took me a little while to learn how to work within the board um, system. I learned a lot about education in general. I learned a lot about our, our school system and our state system. And I've made a lot of great relationships, um, both at the county level and at the state level, advocating for our school system and our students here. I felt that I should take that information and all that knowledge I have and experience and all those strong relationships I have and continue to leverage that uh, for the benefit of our students and our schools and our community. Thank you, Mrs. Schaefer. Those are the opening statements. We will now proceed to Route 1 after I forgot them the first time. Okay, remember these are questions to each of you and you'll each get a 30 second chance to answer after the main speaker gives us a 90 second answer. So the first question is to Mike Benitsky. FCPS has a new salary scale for teachers which will require sustained funding over several years. Will the school board have to make cuts to fund this new teacher pay scale? And if so, where would you make those cuts? You have 90 seconds. Well, first of all, uh, it's, it was uh, four years coming to get to this salary scale. So there was a lot of work put into it. The school board um, has done a lot of negotiations. FCTA put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in making this uh, salary scale. We have a county uh, executive who is extremely supportive of education. We have a county council um, who has funded uh, education uh, at a higher level than it had been before without the uh, uh, entire budget blowing up. It's about $500,000 difference between the previous county commissioners and there's a lot more uh, coming to education at this particular time. I don't believe anything will have to be cut to sustain it. I think uh, between our county executive, our county council, and a board of education that works to problem solve, uh, we should be able to find a way to sustain this because the whole point was to uh, create a salary scale that was sustainable, that didn't require uh, $11 million of new money each year to give a step increase. Thank you, Mike. Now, Ken, you have 30 seconds to respond and add. Um, I, every time with the, we have a board of education election, we have a candidates who to, to find and cut the waste in the system. And once they're actually on the board, there's never any waste that's found, never anything that's cut. So I don't think, it's, I don't think that's what we have to look at. I think that there are places where we can realize efficiency, but in terms of long-term uh, large-scale cuts, I don't think that they are need to be found, and so we will not need to cut the budget in order to fund the new salary scale. Thank you, Ken. Cindy. There is waste in the budget. I don't think you'd have to cut anything to sustain something that they've already put in the budget and found the money to fund, so I don't think you have to cut that. But 
I'll give you a perfect example of waste. The Go Math textbooks that the eighth graders use cost several hundred thousand dollars. They're about two inches thick and we use four pages of that. That's wasteful. We only need four pages of a 60 to 100 page book. So that's wasteful spending and we could start with that and I'm sure that there are many other things in there that we could look for. Mrs. Schaefer. Uh, I was on the board that uh, just um, uh, voted for that new salary scale for uh, many reasons, one of which it's more sustainable, it makes us more competitive, uh, both for recruiting teachers and for retaining them. Um, and our board is extremely mm -hmm. fiscally responsible. Uh, we looked at the figures four years out because that's how long it will take us to move completely onto this new scale. Um, and we would not have made a commitment to change that salary scale if we were not able to fund it uh, with the revenues that we uh, were uh, looking forward and, and, um, and expecting in the next four years. Um, what I'd like to caution is while we are going to be able to do that, there are other things that we'd like to do as a school system that we might not be able to do next year, uh, but we're certainly working on those things too. But I think the salary scale is able to help us not only uh, um, keep our commitment to our employees, but also to look forward in terms of what our school system needs going forward. Thank you. Now we'll go to question two, and Ken will start with the answer to this, a 90-second answer. Ken, would you vote to renew Superintendent Teresa Albin's contract when it comes up for renewal, and why or why not? The, the job of, of an educational leader, such as a superintendent of a college program, is, is a very complicated job. I know if you look at, as I explained, we have over a half a billion dollar budget, 4,000 employees, 66 school buildings. To find someone who can simply manage that is a chore and, a, and then to find someone who can do it as an educational visionary and understands the, the mission and vision of an institution is very difficult. So what I'm saying is that Dr. Alban would not be easily replaced. Uh, I also find that, um, that Dr. Alban is doing a, a credible and admirable job with our schools as you saw in the newspaper just this last week when the latest Valley Park scores came out. We are well ahead of state averages. Curtis County is an educational leader in the state of Maryland and a lot of that is due to Dr. Alvin's leadership and I would see no reason to make a change. Thank you. Cindy, 30 second response. When your superintendent is in direct conflict with the actions of your board of education, they can no longer work together. We've had Dr. Albin working to against HB 1204, which is Ben's rule, which is a law that would allow children without a voice to have their parents refuse for them. As a part of PASAM, she worked against that. She's in direct conflict with what we want to do as a Board of Education. I think it's time for her to go, yes. Mrs. Schaefer. So uh, Dr. Alban serves as the president of PASAM, which is the State Association for Superintendents, which took a position on uh, a bill uh, that our board did support. However, uh, she did not testify against that bill. I think that bill was something that was provided testimony on behalf of all 24 superintendents, um, and it reflected uh, that organization's position on that bill. But in terms of, of renewing her contract, uh, the superintendent, whoever he or she is, serves at the pleasure of the board, and the board lays out all of those uh, uh, deliverables, uh, so to speak, for that superintendent. She has delivered on this. She came in with the board that wanted um, fiduciary responsibility. They wanted to lessen the cost of operating, and that's exactly what she did. Um, they wanted uh, uh, FCPS to be more out into the community and talking to people and engaging the public. Your time that's is exactly up. what she did. So. I think she's delivered on all of the things the board has asked her to do. Mike, 30 seconds. At this point in my career, I've worked for every superintendent since 1980. I would support the renewal of her contract. <clears throat> she has no bonus dollars attached to her contract. She makes a very low salary in comparison to someone who coordinates a budget and a number of people of this size in this area. She's also very good with our business community. Thank you. Go to question three. This is for Cindy Rose. 
What has been this school board's greatest success and greatest failing, and explain why? Its greatest success was adopting the refusal policy, which was in conflict with what Dr. Albin voted for during the hearing before her. She said, no, we didn't have a right, and the Board of Education re passed a refusal policy that was in direct conflict with that judgment of hers, so those two go hand in hand. That's their greatest success. Did you ask, what was the second and the, and the greatest failure. The greatest failure is in not probably pushing back enough against uh, the, the mandated assessments, the Common Core, the outsourcing of public education to unknown others and private entities where we have no control over what happens in the classroom. I'd like to see some more pushback against that. We need local education back. Okay, Mrs. Schaefer. Well, that's hard because I'm gonna have to grade myself. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of successes, I feel, uh, but the greatest one is, is one of our more recent, and that is the new salary scale. And um, that was a very heavy lift uh, on, on both uh, sides. Our employees uh, gave quite a bit to get us to that scale, and our board um, worked hard to get us to that scale, and our, our negotiating teams uh, worked very well together. It was a collaborative process. It wasn't easy, and it was quite long. Um, we've actually attempted it several times before, but that scale, uh, which required a lot of compromise on both sides, puts us in the best financial position to make sure that we uh, do well by our employees, that we retain um, the best and the brightest here, and that we encourage them in their professional growth, and that we also uh, have a sustainable scale that allows us then to put more dollars into the classroom um, in terms of resources and material and real world uh, opportunities for students. And, and the greatest failure? The greatest failure. Um, first, I, I just want to answer the point that we, uh, we are a very uh, proactive board in terms of, uh, we have been the most proactive board I can remember in terms of talking to the state board, in terms of talking to the legislature about a variety of things, um, most recently uh, the overassessments. But um, I will say my biggest failure, I, I think, was to increase class size. Um, we voted for that in order to uh, balance the budget just this past school year. It's one of the reasons I'm running for re-election. I certainly do not want to leave the school system in that kind of shape. Mike? Uh, the greatest success is the most recent one, of course, the salary scale uh, implementation. Uh, the failures are uh, in somewhat, in many respects, myriad. Uh, there's a morale problem uh, in our system that relates back to four years of uh, lack of funding the change in class sizes, in uh, switching uh, uh, grading programs, in implementation of some of the things that we saw tonight. Uh, there's a, a lack of professional development. The professional development is forced onto principals. Principals are having to evaluate. Uh, uh, Lance put 50 students, uh, 50 teachers up there. But if you were at one of our high schools, you have more like 100, 110 uh, that report to you. Uh, shifting things uh, around, shifting employees around, in things that are supposedly cost neutral don't actually help uh, some of our students because our students will now be taught social studies by someone who was a math teacher or an English teacher because a cost neutral shift is moving employees around uh, just like uh, on a chessboard. Thank you, Ken Kerr. Well, I would agree that the greatest success of the current board would be the negotiation of a new salary scale for teachers and probably uh, corollary to that is the greatest failure is that it didn't include staff, especially uh, part-time staff who have seen very little salary adjustment in the last eight years. These people are already um, working minimal hours and um, I think we missed an opportunity by not including them and hope that that's a blessing in the next year. Thank you all four of you. Now we'll go to question number four and Joy Schaefer will start off with the answer to this. What is the biggest problem with testing in the school system right now, and what would you specifically do to fix it? Um, first, I want to say that the federal testing, which is probably what most uh, folks are um, the most concerned about, uh, is something, of course, that's federal law, and then that's also uh, uh, been passed down to us um, by state requirements. Um, do I feel that we need to test every student in, in math and, and language arts every single year in every single school? No, I don't, um, but uh, we are working within the law. I think that we have a lot of, um, we have two opportunities right now. First of all, 
there are untested grades, particularly in the primary grades. And I think that's where we can set the foundation um, uh, for developing a joy of learning amongst our most, our youngest learners. Um, and I also want to remind folks that even though we do have to uh, administer um, mandated testing, uh, the curriculum that we use is developed by our teachers here. I was just at a summer workshop, this happens every summer, um, where teachers work together over several weeks, most of the summer, to develop our own curriculum here to make sure our students are learning what we feel they should be learning. Um, and I don't think it's terrible to have standards to make sure that across the state all of our children are learning um, the same things in math that we feel are basic, the same things in language arts that we feel are basic for success. Um, I'm also very active, and our board has been very active. Uh, right now we have to realign our state education plan, which includes assessments, to realign with the new Education Act. We have an opportunity there to um, refigure, reconfigure our assessments so they're not quite so high stakes, um, and to look at some other, um, some other things that we can look at to make sure that students are uh, thriving in school that aren't necessarily uh, linked to assessments. Time is time's up. Thank you. Mike, question on testing. Well, we have um, in Frederick County, as uh, Ms. Schaefer mentioned, uh, our teachers write many of our assessments throughout the summer. We have some wonderful formative assessments. When you allow teachers to assess, which they do every day, to assess what their children are learning and make a determination as to the pedagogy to move it forward, things are great. The problems are that federal testing, state testing is too time consuming, it's taking away from instructional time, it's tied to federal dollars, it's tied to teacher assessment, it's tied, excuse me, teacher salary, it's tied to teacher advancement, and the dependence on data is very time consuming. Ken. Uh, the biggest problem is the, is the law, every child every year. We don't need to test every child every year to get a sense of how well our curriculum is working, how well our schools are working. The answer to that is to change the law. As I mentioned in my opening comment, I was successful this year. It did take me three years, but I was successful in getting a law changed in Annapolis, and that's the type of uh, advocacy we need on the board to see if we can't um, get these laws changed. Cindy. MSD reported to the state legislator that Frederick County tests its students more than any other county. The only test tied to federal government is the park assessments. We don't need to do the park assessments. The ESSA will also give us leeway in how we treat the park assessments. We can say what our participation rate is or what our participation is going to be. So we can say our participation is I will offer you the test. That's the end of our participation. You don't have to participate. There are many ways out of it. You could do the Title I funding, which is 4% of our budget, which is uh, $4 million. We can probably find that elsewhere and save money by not having to jump through all the hoop testing. Thank you. That concludes the end of round one. Now we'll go to round two, and we'll throw out uh, a general question that each of you will have one minute to answer. There'll be different questions, four different questions. Each of you will have one minute to answer them. There's no response in this section. The first question goes to Joy Schaefer. What is the biggest school construction need in Frederick County right now and why? And specifically, which feeding pattern in the county has the greatest need for new schools? Well, our greatest construction need is at the elementary level, um, and that's in a variety of feeder patterns. Uh, and I'm not going to say um, uh, that we have one over another, because what will happen with construction is, um, because there's such a long timeline of development when, when we're talking about uh, new seats being um, required of the school system, um, that even once a development breaks ground, that might build out over 20 years. You've got that going on all over the county in different stages. So even when you put out a fire, say, with a new elementary school in one part of the county, there's already another burgeoning uh, part of the county that we're going to have to deal with. So uh, I wouldn't say one feeder ha has a precedent over another. It's the board's job to make sure we balance those needs for new seats along with we have aging schools that are desperately in need of updating. Um, and those schools uh, are in just as need of a, a immediate attention as uh, the need for new seats. Um, I, I would say that uh, we, and we are beginning to work together very well with the, uh, the county. Um, they, uh, with the leadership of, of the county executive, um, are moving us toward a more collaborative discussion about development in this county and about 
um, where uh, uh, we have need for capacity and how we should. Time is up. Oh. <laughs> Next question goes to Cindy Rose. In regards to special education, what is FCPS doing or not doing that needs to change and why? You have one minute. Well, one of the best things they're doing is Rock Creek is finally up on to be rebuilt in a whole new place that will better accommodate the children and their needs. So I think that's probably the, the best thing that they're doing for special education right now. I'm a little worried about some of the restructuring and the reorganization of our special education. I have issues with the due process problems that we have wherein students aren't getting the things that they need and it's the burden is on the parent to prove that this isn't happening and our parents don't have the funding to fight the Board of Education or the State of Maryland if we have to go to MSDE and there are laws pending and going to be worked on again this next session to help address the due process issue. I would say those are the two most important things. Thank you. Ken Kerr. Frederick County is the first school system in the state to have a policy on testing refusals. What do you think of this policy and would you change it? Uh, testing refusal is a rational response to a testing policy that uh, has no basis in statistical reality. I also think that there is, it's especially appropriate in areas where we have special needs students education students who are, have not even been exposed to the curriculum at the grade level that's being tested. So uh, refusal and have that policy are a, a rational, and, rational and reasonable response. Thank you. The next question goes to Mike Benitsky. Should the school board ever consider closing schools to save money, and how should that closing process be done? Smaller schools first, older schools first. How should that process be done if the county has to close schools? Mike, one minute. First of all, they should never close schools just to save money. There has to be some other reason behind it. There also will be a lot of community engagement. So uh, the, the determination of what school uh, would possibly be closed has to go through um, a, a complete vetting process by the community a variety of community activities, uh, also uh, outside consultants coming in to study the population. We don't have a, a real good uh, map, census map, but we're working right now and just ha have just hired a consultant, the school board has, uh, to prepare for uh, the changes that have to come with the, the new buildings that we have built. And you have a couple of elementary schools that are over 140% um, capacity or you have a school like Rock Creek that just needs to be replaced, uh, we're going to have to um, go through and look at how our population is spread out and make some determinations, and that will happen as a community, not just uh, the board. Thank you, that concludes round two. Now we're gonna go to round three, which is just like round one. We'll give a question to each of you, but all of you will have a 30 second response to the first answer. And we are going to start uh, randomly here. Uh, and I actually drew pieces of paper. So the first uh, question will go to Cindy Rose. The school's dress code has not been updated since 2004. And girls in particular criticized that code at Urbana Middle School and Linganore High School. And they called it discriminatory to young women. What limits should there be in how students dress, and should the 2004 policy be revised? Well, I support the policy as it is right now. I think children should be wearing modest clothing, and since we've left it to the discretion of the school principal, whether they find that clothing appropriate for the day there, then they should have to cover that up. So I support the policy as it stands. I haven't, I did read the article, so I don't see what the problem was if the skirts are too short and the cleavage is showing and they're not there for fashion day, they're there for learning and education and if it's considered disruptive, then it's considered disruptive. I don't think there's anything sexist about that T to have someone lower their skirt or put their cleavage. The boys aren't running around in muscle shirts. I think their thing was that it was just sexist to say and pick on those particular girls but the thing is we don't let boys run around in shorty shorts and Oh God, I hope they really wouldn't do that anyway, but I'm okay with the policy, really. 
Thank you. Joy Schaefer, 30 seconds to add your view. Yeah, I, I didn't see anything sexist in the policy either, but I would certainly be willing to uh, review it um, uh, for purposes of just updating it. Um, but again, the reason for the dress code is really so that students can concentrate on what they're there for. And uh, all of our policies have an instructional purpose at their root. So I would, um, I would support the policy that we have in place. Uh, I think it helps students to concentrate on what they're there to do, which is to learn, and supports the principal in making sure that as the instructional leader of that building, that, um, that the focus is on where it should be. Okay, Mike, 30 seconds. Um, sexism was more in the application of the policy. The policy itself was not, a, it was not sexist in, in any way, shape, or form. It's the application. Uh, the students need to be involved in this. If you're going to have student buy-in in the way in which uh, they appear to their peers, you need to get them together and uh, student leaders can help to write this. It's one of the reasons why the student member of the board uh, should have a vote on some things like this. Thank you. Ken. Schools shouldn't be in artificial environments where the rules of the outside world don't apply or the rules of the school don't apply to the outside world. What we should do is encourage students to develop professional habits that are going to serve them well in their professional lives. That not only includes uh, things like how they're dressed, but also the appropriate use of their cell phones and showing up on time and all of those other things. Thank you. Next question will begin with Mike Panitsky. Mike, the school board recently voted to allow the student member of the board to vote. What power should the student member of the board of education have? Well, personally, having um, been responsible for helping to get elected the student member of the board since 1994, um, I've learned that if you listen to them, they can teach you a lot. There are uh, approximately 145 regulations and policies in the school system. About 30 of them directly affect students. Testing, grading, dress code, uh, discipline. There's a variety of, of things that each of our students if throughout our schools should have a say in. They should have the opportunity to ha have a vote. Our, our local uh, student member from last year she did an accounting of how many votes would have changed if she had had the opportunity to have her vote counted, and there was zero. So one more vote isn't going to change the world. It's not going to swing anything, but it is going to give students a, a buy-in to what's going on in their own system and give them a voice that they may, they may show up a little more often and speak at the board. Public comment is, is a time when they should uh, they have that opportunity to come in and speak their mind, as well as talking to their own representative on the board. So there are about 25 areas of those regulations where I believe they should have that right to vote. But are there areas where you would not want them to vote, Mike? Um, absolutely. In uh, finances, uh, in anything that deals with um, the budget, in areas of employee employment, uh, so any of the private things that deal with our teachers, our uh, educators, keeping them on board. Yes, there's many areas, but there are many areas where they should have that right. Ken. A student uh, member should be able to vote on student welfare issues, those type of discretionary decisions that govern how students interact throughout the day. Things like the dress code, things like, um, like the calendar. It would be interesting to get student input on the, uh, on the school calendar. But the things that they shouldn't vote on are the things that deal with legal issues, confidentiality, uh, budgetary matters, personnel type issues. Cindy, student member. I don't believe the student member should have the right to vote. The population of Frederick County didn't get to vote the student in, only the students did. The student member should have his opinion respected and honored. He is there giving the student's opinion of how things should go, and we should treat that with some weight but he shouldn't have voting authority, and if he would have affected zero votes, then there really isn't a need for him to vote. Joy Schaefer, 30 seconds. Uh, well, I, in my experience, and, and prior to my board experience, having been a watcher of the Board of Education, uh, we have had stellar student members of the board that go through a fairly um, rigorous vetting process, and they're often kids that have been involved in student government since they were able to be involved in student government. Um, we are not the only county that allows the student uh, to vote. 
Uh, in fact, one county gives them full rights to vote, and we certainly won't be doing that. Uh, I won't reiterate the, the um, areas that we won't be allowing a student vote, but they've been mentioned contracts, uh, budget, personnel issues, and the like. Um, but the reason I got into, I got on the board was because I was an advocate, and I kept saying, I'd like to advocate, but I don't have the vote, and I felt like I should kind of put my money where my mouth is and, and allow that student to have the vote on things that directly affect them. Thank you. The next question will go to Joy Schaefer. A high school football coach here resigned his position as coach after allegations that he struck a student athlete. Without commenting on a specific case, how far should coaches be able to go in disciplining student athletes? Uh, well, I, I feel very uncomfortable uh, making a comment on this. Um, because it's been in the paper, uh, I, I don't like to, to add to, to whatever public opinion is out there, and this is something that might come to the board in terms of an appeal situation, uh, so I'm going to respectfully decline to answer that question. Okay. Mike, would you add in your 30 seconds? I agree with Ms. Schaefer. Ken. I, I'll just add that I think that coaches should have the same level of contact with students in terms of discipline that a classroom teacher does. Cindy. Without knowing the details of this case, I'm not comfortable making a comment on it either as far as coach and student interaction. If it's football, there is a tendency to be touching. So if you're going to be defining that, I guess you need some strict regulations on how you're going to define that. Was he struck? Was, he, was it just a football thing? I mean, that's a very difficult position to be in. So yeah, I wouldn't answer it farther than that. Okay, some sensitivity to that question. All right, uh, the next question goes to Ken as the lead off. The Frederick County Sheriff's Office routinely s sends in drug sniffing dogs to the public schools. Recently, the Thurmont City Police Department sought to increase the use of its own drug sniffing dog to patrol student lockers and parking lots in schools in Thurmont. If your child attended Thurmont area schools, how would you feel about this? And how far should student privacy go in the schools? Well, uh, with any other legal matter involving police searches, there has to be probable cause. And uh, without probable cause, it's just a, a violation of the student's uh, right to uh, be protected against illegal search and seizure. Uh, that said, we do have a we do have a growing problem with with heroin in this county that I think we'll need to address at some time. Cindy. Okay, so the Frederick County Sheriff's Office already does random drug sniffing in the school. So your question is, is the municipality, do you, are we for them doing it above and beyond what the Sheriff's Office is doing? That's your question? Yeah, and how do you feel generally about yeah. uh, this kind of... Uh, uh, Students sniffing. are aware in the, uh, in the school policies that and occasionally a drug sniffing dog will be brought into the school just as a precautionary measure. Uh, I'm okay with it and if Thurmont or any other mu municipality has their own drug sniffing dogs and they can do it more frequently, as long as everyone's made aware that this is a procedure that's going to be happening, I don't have a problem with it. Joy Schaefer. Uh, I um, first of all, this is a, a practice that's done regularly in our schools, and they're usually at the discretion of the principal. If the principal thinks that it's, it's necessary, he, he or she suspects a, an issue. And Thurmont is pr pr responding directly to crises that are happening in their town, and, and we're very respectful as a board of that. So um, we put them together uh, with uh, the proper law, law, our law enforcement contacts and, um, and and decided, you know, you go ahead and discuss what your needs are. We'll, we'd happily support that if, if that's what you feel like your community needs. It's part of the strengths of um, uh, site-based uh, management, which is what we rely on. Our communities are so diverse and different, and their needs are so diverse and different. I think we need to be able to um, make sure that our communities and our schools and our law enforcement there that support our schools and our learning for our students are able to um, uh, react and respond to uh, that specific community's needs. Thank you. Now we have one final question. Uh, I have an extra question that I wanted to ask, and I'm going to give each of you one minute to answer it. It's all on the same topic. Uh, we'll start with you, Mike. FCPS is trying hard to secure private and corporate funding for a new flexible curriculum program for Frederick High School called LYNX, L-Y-N-X, linking youth to new experiences. 
what role should businesses have in funding public education? You have one minute. In public education in general or just this program? Uh, uh, both. I, I, well, I believe that uh, locally, I think we should be uh, part of uh, trying to fund this program to see if we can uh, get it off the ground. I think it's a great program, uh, or it holds potential, I should say. I have no idea whether it'll be a great program. It may or may not work. Um, we're never gonna get it off the ground if we don't do a little bit of business uh, smoothing and get some money in here for it, because it's $10 million that we lost in the grant. We're not going to get that. So we need to see how it's going to work. If we keep having 21st century schools run in a 19th century way, it's not going to change anything. So we need to try, at least in one school, to move outside of the box. Um, Dr. Kerr has been in involved with uh, the dual enrollment program. The dual enrollment program was another one of the steps that we took to try and move ourselves into uh, another generation. We had a presentation here about digital technology. That's going to help move our school system. Um, I, I believe wholeheartedly that our local community can be involved in assisting a school to determine whether this is going to work or not. As far as pu uh, public funding, uh, excuse me, business funding for schools, um, it's working really well uh, with Jan Gardner and the way in which uh, we're funding some of the capital programs, so in that venue, it seems to be doing pretty good. Ken Kerr, same question, one minute. The, uh, the Lynx program does hold a great deal of promise. It, uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, it provides a flexible schedule of school reopen from 8 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock at night to give uh, students some, some flexibility in when they choose to go to school so it best fits their lifestyle. I'm a little bit worried when we think we have to go out to private and business interests in order to balance an operating budget, and I wouldn't want to see if we get to that point. But in, if we're talking about uh, corporate sponsorships of specific programs such as internships, then I think that those are the types of relationships that we should be pursuing. Cindy, one minute. I'm okay with private funding as long as there's no quid pro quo. If we're going to give you money, but we're not going to expect you to change your curriculum or your standards or how you're teaching or anything of that matter. As far as links specific goes, how you fund it, I don't think why would you need extra funding above and beyond what they want to do. And my other problem with the links school is it's only for the people in that area. It's the inequity. They get carve outs. They won't have to do the common core. They'll get enrichment that other classrooms won't get. So excluding the funding portion, just the general idea of links and only those things being allowed to happen there, I'm not for that. But for private funding, as long as there's no quid pro quo, I'm okay with that. Joy Schaefer. Uh, I would agree with the, the uh, looking for alternate funding as long as there is no uh, strings attached. I don't know that that's ever in existence. Um, my only concern with that is public education is a public good. And if we truly believe that that's a public good, then we should be willing to pay for it with public dollars. So what my hope would be is that the, the support for that doesn't erode um, because we're getting funding from other sources. But at the same time, um, funding is finite. So uh, if we really want to do the next step for kids and the next step for schools, uh, that might be a, a place where we're going to have to look. I do want to clarify that even though a $10, $10 million grant was mentioned, Link's program does not cost that much. That was the grant over a period of years and uh, we would have used that money for some other things as well. Um, but if you're looking at the program that they're looking at now to sort of pilot at Frederick High, that's more around a million dollars. And like any of our programs, we're open to any and all schools. Um, the school leadership that looks across the, the county and says, hey, that's working over at Oakdale High, I'd like to see what that's about, and then maybe next year I'd like to try it out. So all of, those, all of our programs, they may start at one school, but um, are, can be spread, and we encourage that, especially if they're successful for students. Thank you. That concludes our Q&A portion of the forum. And now we're going to go into closing statements. And this is going to be uh, at random order as well. So first, we will start with Ken Kerr. You have 90 seconds for your closing statement. OK, thank you. As a, as a teacher, as a college professor, as a college administrator, I've seen education from the classroom and the boardroom. And these different views have given me a different perspective, the perspective to understand how decisions made by the board on Wednesday night are going to affect the lives of students and teachers and staff and their parents on Thursday morning. And I have a, a strong conviction that public education is important. It's the center of our community. 
and I also have a strong commitment to public service. I have demonstrated my ability to make decisions that improve teaching and learning, and I've, I've been on both sides of the money, and I know how to make the money that is allocated work best. Public education is a, is a time-honored profession and a time-honored American tradition, and we need to protect it and nurture it, not dismantle it and not weaken it. We need board members who will be vigilant in the defense and care of this cornerstone of democracy. I have respect for students and their parents and the teachers and the unique relationship that all of them share. I have the courage to stand up for my convictions and the time and energy to dedicate to this office. You get three votes. Please use all three of them and please give one of them to me. <laughs> Next on the list, closing statement, 90 seconds, Joy Schaefer. Uh, well, again, thank you all for coming. And uh, I just want to close by saying um, the Board of Education is important because it sets the environment in which our students learn and in which our teachers teach. Um, and that's the environment that they go to every day. And that is incredibly important. Um, and I'm so glad that we started with Mr. Ruggi's um, presentation, what do we want teaching and learning to look like. Uh, what I want teaching and learning to look like is students are surrounded by highly qualified, caring adults all day and are given opportunities, real world learning experiences to uh, discover the joy of learning, to love, uh, find something that they love so that when they graduate from FCPS, they have all the tools that they need to be successful in doing what they love and, in, um, and being able to do what they love and love what they do. Um, and that really is the bottom line for me to make sure that we reach every student with the resources and the support that they need and to give them exactly what they need in order to be successful and um, happy adults that are um, self-supporting and that give back to our community and that we function as a school system in a responsible way that also allows us to play our part in the larger county in terms of giving back to the county with jobs, um, with a quality of life, with a highly educated workforce, with successful citizens, um, and uh, growing our county and keeping it vibrant. Thank you. The next closing statement goes to Mike Benitsky, 90 seconds. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sexton. Thank you for, uh, for the post for uh, hosting this forum. And thank all of you for being here. Um, as a teacher for 40 years, felt education as a calling. It was something that spoke to me and gave me great job satisfaction. Um, I enjoyed myself in my classroom all the time. Uh, that was one of my main goals, was if I was having a good time, I knew my students would be as well. Uh, I believe that the best thing to educate a young person is a dedicated, educated, caring, and motivated teacher with the resources to do the job. Some of those teachers that were, uh, that my kids had are sitting out here today, and they really motivated my kids. And I know it's because they were dedicated. It wasn't because they had the most technology, it's because they had a small enough class and they cared, they listened. I will work for adequate funding, adjusting staffing formulas, trying to continue the sustainable salary scale. Uh, I'm looking forward to serving the community that I've lived in low these many years and I still have children in um, I want you to exercise your full voting rights I was a government teacher you need to vote you need to go and look down ballot you need to use all three votes on November 8th for the Board of Education and I hope I've earned one of those go to FNP podcast to listen to all of us and read about all of us and make your decision thank you Cindy Rose you have the final closing statement 90 seconds the Board of Education are the gatekeepers. If you're tired of the politicization of education, if you believe education is supposed to be inspiring, if you want to put an end to the current reform of data collection and cross-comparison of apples to space shuttles, culminating in a stamp of college and career ready, then I ask you to consider voting for me. I'll be fighting for real local community control, not the status quo. It's time to stop treating our children like commodities. 
and teachers like an afterthought. It's time to restore joy and inquiry to learning. Let's stop looking for solutions from people who don't know, let alone care about the futures of our children. I ask you to vote for me. You don't have to vote for three. You can vote for one, you can vote for two. Vote for who will do what you want them to do. Don't put your vote on someone who you really don't know anything about or believe in what they're asking you to, to vote for them for. You can find out more about me on frederickforlocalcontrol.com or Cindy Rose on Facebook. Thank you, candidates. That concludes our forum. I have a couple of reminders for people. Uh, number one, and I appreciate, uh, I think, uh, Mike who said it, we have podcasts with all four of these candidates on our website at Frederick News Post. Please watch them. They're actually quite interesting, and they're even more lengthy than this. You get a real good sense of uh, these four people here, so I urge you to go to our website and or download your podcasts at, at iTunes or anywhere else. Uh, that's one reminder. Number two reminder is that uh, there are three openings on the board. Uh, there are four candidates. You vote for three, but as Cindy said, you can vote for one or two, whatever, but uh, most people generally vote for three. Uh, one last thing, the election is November 8th. Uh, we urge you to vote. That is our civic responsibility as Americans, and I urge everyone to exercise that right. Finally, I'll leave you with a quote from Mark Twain, who wrote this about schools. Every time you stop a school, you will have to build a jail. What you gain at one end, you lose at the other. It's like feeding a dog on his own tail. It won't fatten the dog. Thank you and good night. Let's give a round of applause for our candidates.